So actually, I'd like to use my 20 seconds to give a shout out to Michelle. Hi. Yes, hey. you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, God. Yep, super excited. Michelle Hi. is uh, participating in some ASMBS program. So very excited to have her here and all of you guys. Um, I think that's probably 20 seconds. So hi, everybody. I am S. Julianne Lloyd. I'm a MIS bariatric surgeon um, in Houston, Texas at Baylor. I'm super excited to welcome you guys to the first installment of the START program. Um, today, we'll be having an exciting and awesome presentation by Dr. Shimke, um, who I will try to introduce. I'm sure he'll say some things about himself as well. Um, but he is... Um, Currently at Rush uh, University, he um, completed fellowship at Duke University before in MIS and bariatrics. Um, he did his medical degree at Wayne State University and um, did residency at Rush as well. Um, he is a prolific um, author and excellent surgeon. So you guys are in um, store for some great presentations today about how to do the ruin wide gastric bypass. Um, in the peanut gallery, I'm also joined mm -hmm. by Dr. Hassan and Dr. Dan, um, also two ASMBS stars and uh, MIS bariatric surgeons. Um, so with that, you know, I don't really want to take up much, that much time. Um, go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Julianne. And uh, it's exciting to be here. It's uh, the second uh, year doing this. And so it's still a little bit of in its infancy and we continue to to make things better year by year. But uh, the same core group of faculty and Julianne and Monique and Dan and um, uh, a lot of other people that uh, are part of this that aren't on the call, but it's been a, a fun experience and hopefully you guys uh, gain a lot from this. Uh, and it's uh, at the same time, please give all of your honest feedback because uh, we'll, we're kind of learning what's best and what you guys like. Uh, and obviously we don't know that until you give us uh, your honest feedback. So I appreciate it. I didn't share my screen yet, just so you know who I am and what I look like. Um, I will not be on the hands-on portion of your course. Uh, so I just wanted to say hello to everyone. I unfortunately can't make that part, but I'll be very much involved in all the other uh, didactic portions of uh, this year's uh, course. And I'll be at the meeting uh, in, uh, what are we, San Diego, I believe, in, in June, which will be uh, such an awesome place. I love going there for, for all meetings. It'll be a lot of fun. So without further ado, let me reshare my screen here. Let's get right into it. <clears throat> Right, and I have to move some things out of the way, start presentation. All right, can you guys see the normal screen or is it the- Yeah, it's, the... No, it's perfect. Okay, all right. Every once in a while, I'll get it right here. All right, so we're talking about the robotic gastric bypass. Um, I, uh, like Julian said, I'm a, uh, uh, trained in uh, MIS bariatric surgery, but 80% of my practice is uh, bariatric. Um, and in full disclosure, I am a consultant for intuitive, although I'd say in this talk, in this program, that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. It's a, it's a good thing. I uh, About most of my bariatric uh, operations I do are robotic, uh, the bypass included. And I'll go into a little bit of numbers here uh, towards the end. Um, some of the slides here that I show are, are for audience that uh, is definitely not uh, at your level below. We're talking about what does a gastric bypass look like? I think everyone in this room knows exactly what a gastric bypass looks like. Um, so starting at the beginning, uh, I'm all about efficiency. I'm definitely kind of a, a German engineer kind of background. And so I, I've worked uh, relentlessly with our hospital. And actually, uh, this tray here is, is old. Uh, we actually have an updated tray. But we've really worked on getting the back table really as, as trim as possible. And so uh, right now, we actually have that middle tray where you see all those graspers is now gone. And essentially, that's what our back table looks like. So uh, there's a liver bar, there's a couple of ports, and there's a couple of instruments to, to close skin, essentially. And that's about it. So it's a very bare bones back table. And the OR staff, of course, loves it because there's almost nothing they have to open. Uh, just need, obviously, the robot and the robotic instruments. So um, <clears throat> as far as port placement, there's a lot of different ways to do uh, robotic bypasses and a variety of uh, operations oh, with a variety of port placements. Oops, excuse me. Oh, sorry. I thought somebody was uh, saying something. Um, but uh, what you see here from left to right is there's a 12 port, uh, then followed by the camera port, which is an eight millimeter port. And the next one to the right uh, is a 
um, another 12 port and then uh, an eight port. So it's kind of 12, eight, 12, eight. Uh, I do typically a bi-directional JJ, but I'll show you two different versions of how to do the JJ anastomosis. And because of that, you need a 12 port essentially in your left hand, which is arm one, uh, and your right hand, which is arm three. Uh, obviously the camera port, uh, arm two, and then arm four, which is the assistant port are just eight uh, millimeter ports. Uh, and then I have the Nathanson uh, retractor up top there. There's a variety of different liver bars out there. Our hospital at Rush only has that one. So that's the one I use. Um, and uh, slight reverse trend Nullenberg, uh, not too much, especially with the liver bar, you don't need a whole lot, but pretty standard positioning and port placement. And of course, with the robot duct, uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, no surprises there. Um, uh, quick question, can I interrupt yeah. you real quick? Yeah, sorry. Um, so for your port placement, do you ever use an assistant port? Do you think there's any benefit to putting one in? Uh, I don't for a bypass. I do for duodenal switch. Uh, I use an assistant port. Um, but for the bypass, I put everything in at the beginning of the case. Um, and so essentially all the needles, uh, I put a ray tech in. Everything I need is in the beginning. So, um, you know, uh, unless something really went wrong and you need an extra suction or something like that, there is really no need for an assistant port in my, uh, from my point of view. But uh, I'm sure there are some people out there that use assistant ports for bypasses. Um, and speaking of before docking, this is what I do put in the abdomen before I start. Uh, I put a ray tech in just in case, you know, best case scenario, you don't need it and that's okay. Um, I put in a three or absorbable V-lock and that's for the gastro Um, if you hand sew the JJ, you put a second, uh, three O absorbable V-lock in, I put a three O non-absorbable V-lock, which is for the JJ mesenteric closure. Uh, I put in 3.0 silk, and that's uh, for the pseudo or Peterson's defect, however you want to call it. It's a purse string. And then I have a 3.0 Vicryl stitch, uh, which is a, a utility stitch, and I'll show you kind of what that looks like. But all of those are put in at the very beginning of the case before I even dock the robot. So uh, overview of how I do the operation, limb lengths are as shown. Uh, I know we could argue for for days about limb lengths, but uh, standard limb lengths, I think uh, for most people, um, kind of the steps of the operation, how I progress, I do the GJ first, uh, which is most common when you're doing a robotic uh, gastric bypass. Uh, and then I do the JJ and then we close uh, the defects. Uh, the GJ anastomosis is a single layer running uh, suture. The JJ, two different ways to do it. Uh, there's a bi-directional or you call it a tri-staple or a triple staple technique. Or you can do just a single fire, 60 millimeter, and then sew the common enterotomy. Uh, I do it both ways, uh, but more commonly uh, in my practice in my hospital, I do the bi-directional because other surgeons do it the other way. And so we, we want to make sure that the residents and fellows kind of see it both ways consistently. So, uh, And then I, like I said, close the defects. <clears throat> any questions, any, any comments up until now before we get into videos? You guys can uh, feel free to post some questions in the chat or in the Q and A. Put your hand up. You know, feel free to ask questions, please. Yeah, Julian, just interrupt me. I think in presentation mode, it's hard to see the chat slash impossible. So if people chime in, just please do interrupt. So yeah, I'll keep an eye out. Okay, perfect. Um, so I use what's called a utility stitch, and I'll play the video as I kind of talk about this. But essentially. Um, the robot's in, in, obviously docked, and I'm running the bowel and kind of measuring that ligament atrites uh, about 50 to 75 centimeters. And what I use is a, called a utility stitch. And the reason why I call it that is because I use it to mark the bowel here, which is what you're going to see. But that same exact stitch I use later on in the case to set up my JJ anastomosis. So it's a longer suture, uh, which makes it a little unwheeling at first, but I'm able to use it over and over again and kind of going back to that efficiency and that way I don't have to take in sutures, pull them out, bring in new sutures, pull them out. I just use the same suture over and over again, uh, which I find much more efficient than having to use an assistant port or uh, you know bring sutures in and out. So uh, I put two different st stitches in just to mark what's proximal and distal. Um, and uh, you'll see there, we'll cut that one. That is distal, so that'll be the future rulim. And then I put another stitch more proximal and that will be the, um, future uh, biliopancreatic limb. Um, I like doing this uh, just to also inspect the bowel, make sure the mesentery length is adequate. 
uh, nothing worse than doing a bypass and realize <clears throat> your rule limb doesn't reach. Uh, especially a lot of patients now, their reoperations and had other abdominal surgeries. So it's a good time now to make sure that there's no uh, adhesions in the small bowel or anything that would, uh, you know, make the operation either, uh, you know, you'd have to board, you know, obviously, if it's really dangerous, or you have to maybe do an open operation or whatever adhesiolysis you need to do, you understand what you're getting into before you commit to the operation. Because once you make the pouch, obviously, then you're, you're, you're really committed. So we have a question from the audience. Where do you put the sutures when you pass them into the abdomen? Like, where do you store them? Yeah, uh, I put the Raytec up by the spleen just so it's handy. And I put all four sutures that I put in, I put over by the gallbladder. So it's still accessible, uh, but at the same time, doesn't get in the way of the operation. So I put them over, over by the, the right lobe of the liver by the gallbladder. So you just lay them on the, the bowel or... Oh uh, yeah, they're just laying on the liver, gallbladder, bowel. Just okay. uh, you know, they're all pretty long stitches. You don't really go over there ever, and so uh, it's I've never had a problem. They just kind of hang out there, and I, I pick, I go over there to the gallbladder and pick them up one by one as I need them. So I, a I, quick, um, I, can I uh, just interrupt for a sec? Yeah, um, I was the just going to ask uh, Scott when you um, when you lift up your LOT and you're doing the orientation for your bowel um can you just comment about which direction um because you started with the stitch on your um video so um in terms of maintaining your orientation of the bowel is there something that you're looking for when you you know first start in terms of orienting the bowel absolutely so it's a, it's a clockwise fashion and you can kind of see here um as it goes around so i keep the mesenteric root kind of at the center and i'll go back one more time so you can see it but uh, it's really, really important. And I really harp on our fellows and residents because if you screw this up right now, you're doomed from the get-go because you can do the best operation, but then all of a sudden you've essentially uh, flipped your entire uh, operation 180 degrees. So um, I do a clockwise fashion, so um, around this way. And so when you run it that way, proximal is this limb to the right and then moving distal, which is what I'm suturing right there. So really, really important clockwise uh, for this part of the operation. So I have to say, you know, usually um, when I'm doing the bypass, there are a couple of times during the operation when I ask not to be disturbed by any of the staff. Um, and it's like measuring the bowel. And then once, once we get the orientation, um, so I actually don't do the suturing. I think this is pretty nifty though. Um, but like once I start doing my anastomosis, like I just make sure that I maintain the orientation. So this is, um, as Monique was pointing out, um, you know, kind of one of the critical portions to be very focused. Absolutely. I mean, it's there's there's a lot of ways to do it, but in the end, you need to make sure you have your orientation correct. Um, I, I think a lot of surgeons don't do this because it's an extra step, but as long as you, you have that orientation, then you're good to go. It's just kind of an insurance stitch. I also use that stitch there for the JJ. And so it's not all... Uh, and wasted uh, suturing. It's and it's also a good warm up for the fellows and people uh, whatnot to get a nice quick stitch or two in before we really get into the meat of the operation. So, all right. So speaking of uh, kind of getting into the meat of the operation, the gastric pouch. Uh, so there's two different ways to to get into the lesser sac. There's the the paragastric technique, which is what I use, or you can do the the pars flaccida technique. Um, I, uh, the faculty here can tell you what they do, but I personally do the, the paragastric technique unless, uh, for some reason I can't, um, typically, it, uh, my pouch, uh, looks about one transverse fire across, obviously make sure all tubes and things are out of the stomach. That's kind of like a, a mini timeout that we do to make sure you absolutely, there's nothing in the stomach. Cause that you can imagine could be a, a disaster. Um, one transverse fire across, and then typically, uh, two uh, fires up. Uh, my The surgeons at the hospital always tell me I tend to make a, a quote, small pouch. I don't really know what that means, but uh, I, that's kind of the, the size pouch that I normally uh, strive for. Uh, I think the key with a, a small pouch is, you know, it minimizes your risk of ulcers. Uh, it improves your gastric emptying, but you always, always, always have to make sure that your rule limb can reach. So uh, it's great. You can make a nice small pouch, but if your rule limb is not going to reach up there, uh, then you're going to have some serious problems. So that's why I kind of run the ball first, make sure that mesentery reaches up there, kind of mark out where it can and can't reach. And so then when I make my pouch, I know that I won't have 
uh, high tension anastomosis. Um, other thing uh, that I mentioned, oh, if there's bleeding in the sac, if I have fire and other load, you know, there's oftentimes there's not a great visualization when you start to make this pouch and especially early, early in your learning curve. And so if you can't really get a good visualization of what's going on, always see if you can take a next staple fire and kind of open up that space a little bit more before you start doing anything, you know, by throwing stitches, bovey, things like that. Uh, sometimes you can cause more harm than good by blindly going in and uh, doing something that maybe uh, you shouldn't have in the first place. My apologies, I forgot to start the video, the most obvious part of here. Um, so this is the um, paragastric technique, uh, vessel sealer in my right hand. Um, I should say the fellow's right hand, but in our right hand and then in the left hand, uh, just I use a bipolar, although um, I'm infamous for stepping the bipolar pedal by accident. So I actually never uh, turn on the bipolar per se, unless I actually need it. So that way I don't accidentally buzz something in my left hand that I don't intend on buzzing. So um, here you can see we're getting into the lesser sac. Um, you know, it's about a five centimeter pouch or the second transverse vein or something like that. Everyone has their kind of new nuances of how they do that. But you can see uh, this is the first transverse fire. Uh, I typically use all white loads. Uh, this is a little bit of a controversial uh, topic here. Um, but I found that uh, for the majority of the stomachs, a white load is sufficient. Uh, if it is a thicker stomach, you can always use a blue load. It's funny that I'm using a white load here, but I still... Uh, yeah. kind of nailed that vessel. <laughs> um, it happens. And that's where the bipolar and the, the technology comes in and kind of just zap that. But um, don't panic. If anything, it shows that your uh, your vascular pouch is uh, very, very well perfused. In this case, it just kind of give it a quick, quick tap there and it's good to go. So um, just for clarification. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned on the slide here, it's 45 millimeters. So you're still using the 60 millimeter staple load, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, that's a completely different um, stapler, actually, if you try to do the 45. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, so I just don't insert it all the way. Um, some people's stomachs are small enough. If you insert it all the way transversely, you almost transect their stomach. So uh, I find it that's unnecessary to use the full 60 for the transverse fire. So um, the thing that I kind of learned uh, early on in my attending years and kind of late fellowship years, is this is really kind of the the the, the the, I meant to say the most complicated part, but really the critical part of making a nice uh, tight pouch. You know, some people use sizers like bougies or balloons. I don't, uh, but I think the key is you really want to hug that left cruise and really get to that angle of hiss, as you can see there. The temptation is to go lateral to the right up by the splenic hilum. And so, because it's always it seems very inviting to go that direction. Um, if you go that way, A, you'll end up in the splenic hilum, but B, uh, you'll have kind of a bigger pouch and kind of an unwieldy pouch and you'll might take you more than staple loads than you really need to get up to the angle of his. So I think it's really, really important uh, to hug that left cruise and get right to the angle of his. Um, I, I learned that uh, kind of with my efficiency in my early learning curve when I was doing these uh, robotically, I tended to go a little far too, too far lateral. So it's one of the things that I learned kind of with experience. I don't know. Uh, um, Julianne, do you use like a size or anything when you make your yeah, pouches? Yeah, so typically, yeah, I put the bougie down. So I do my first file. And actually on the first load, I kind of um, uh, tend to angle it upwards towards the GE junction. So I'm not going straight across. I'm kind of at an angle. And then I have anesthesia come down with the bougie um, as I'm putting in the second load, just to mm -hmm. make sure I'm like really hugging it. I agree with you. I like to make my pouch pretty small as well. Um to always have them pass the bougie and I do my second, um, you know, vertical firing before they remove it. Yeah. yeah. What do you guys do? Um, Monique and Adrian. Um, I use a, well, I also use the pars placida, uh, technique that, um, that Scott was mentioning. Um, so, you know, I, I love that you're showing the perigastric, but I'm telling you every time I've tried that perigastric technique, it is bloody as all get out. So I just, and every time I want to do it, I'm always like, okay, let me do it. And then it's bloody. And I'm like, this is why I don't like this. Um, so, um, so I don't use that. And so what I actually do is I have anesthesia, put the bougie, I use a 40 French visage. I have them put it all the way down and almost like, almost like a sleeve where we, um, and it helps to extend the stomach and lay it out flat. Um, so then I can clearly see those veins. And then I take that descending branch that you have right there. 
Um, and I take that branch with the vessel sealer. And then, um, and then before I even um, start my pouch, I actually mobilize at the angle of his first, um, just so that I can expose my left cruise to look for a hiatal hernia. Um, so that's another option, um, I think, too, when you're creating your pouch, just to make sure that you're um, right there on the, the left, um, that left cruise. But I think that this, this technique that you're doing, Scott, is really good because it also, I think for people that are graduating when they first get out, it's much harder because I do one twelve and three eights. And I think this, this nice straight angle on for making your pouch, that lateral, um, wall is really nice. Um, and when I first started doing, um, some of my, um, robotic gastric bypasses, I really liked having that 12, um, but it was for me, I, I was going to ask you at the end, if you find that it's really hard to close that second 12. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So actually, so on the bypasses, any, uh, on the, any of my bariatric cases that I don't remove any specimens, the bypass would be one of them. I don't close 12s at all. Fashion. Yeah. So. Okay. Ooh, so that, okay. that yeah, I know. Point. I was like, I'm oh, I'm nervous just now. <laughs> That's like a mic drop right there. <laughs> what? Yep. It's it's a it's a controversial topic for sure. Now sleeves, of course, you taking stomach out of the twelve. I absolutely close that. Yeah. Um, if I take any specimens out, I will close it. But if it's just a port and I don't remove anything from it, I don't close uh, twelve. So same with duodenal switch as well. Living on the edge, huh? Yeah. Living on the edge. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the PARS, um, not the PARS, sorry, the um, taking down angle of hits, Monique, because in this video, I noticed that there is a dimple at the hiatus. And I was going to ask you, you know, whether you tend to repair hiatal hernias when you're doing um, the bypass. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 in this case, I honestly can't remember if we, uh, I normally fix it first before doing the pouch, full disclosure. I can't remember if we fixed it in this patient or not. Um, but I would say if there, if there's a dimple and that's it, um, then no on a bypass. But if there's anything that like I can like pull out, if there's like a sack that I can literally pull out, even if it's just a little bit, then I will go ahead and fix it. Um, both bypass and sleeve. I know some people are much more aggressive and fix all of them. Some people leave them. I, I don't have a good answer there. I don't, I'll be curious what everyone else does, but just a dimple and nothing really goes into it. Uh, I don't with the bypass. So Julianne, I'll jump in just to say. Yeah, we, I was just about to call my, on you. Yeah, my two sons are, we are very aggressive about fixing the, the hiatal hernias because with a small stomach like that, a small pouch, they can be a lot more symptomatic than somebody who has uh, what we consider normal anatomy. Um, I agree with everything Monique said, so I'm not going to um, rehash everything. I, I do my, my pouch very similar to that. I think it's an important thing to bring up since we're talking about robotic surgery that the ability to dissect posteriorly, stay tight on the cruise and do it over a VCG or a 40 French bougie truly allows you to get a nice small pouch along the lesser curvature where the musculature is thicker and less likely for the pouch to expand. A lot of times when you compare this to a laparoscopic techniques, particularly where the pouch has to be a little bit more horizontal with the linear stapler technique where a hand-sewn anastomosis is more difficult laparoscopically. In that situation, you might have a pouch that over time might have an easier time dilating because of the, the thinner fundus. So just something to keep in mind uh, when you ask yourself, why would I do a gastric bypass robotically? Why should I take this on? Uh, it's really nice to be able to do that hand-sewn technique not that it can't be done laparoscopically, but it's pretty darn nice with this technology. So I wonder, do the rest of you guys feel the same about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is honestly one of my favorite uh, operations to perform on a robot just because mm -hmm. there's so much suturing and it's, you know, everything is really nicely, elegantly set up. So mm -hmm. I agree with you, Adrian. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think I, I think also, I mean, Scott mentioned it when he brought up that Omega loop. Um, I think that that's one of the advantages of this technique too. I, I don't ever think that when I was lab, I ever was like always 100% confident that my small bowel would reach to my pouch. 
Um, it was always like, let's do the JJ. Oh, oh gosh, I hope it reaches. <laughs> but, you know, let's make the pouch a little bit longer so that we can get this ruling up. But, you know, I've never really, you know, and, I, and I'm doing larger and larger BMIs, um, you know, robotically um, for gastric bypass, where lap, I, I really don't think I would have even attempted it because it just it just comes out, it comes together so, so much not nicer robotically, I think. So. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, oftentimes we're doing these bypasses in more complex patients and reoperative patients, and you have to do maybe extensive adhesives of elation. Uh, you know what I, yeah. adhesives of elation. I can't yeah, even yeah. talk. Taking out all those things. There we go. Too many, too much <laughs> talking today. Um, but you can, you can do all that uh, obviously uh, robotically, and then you can get to the bypass. I found that uh, I've had to do, you know, a couple of times, uh, license of adhesions for an hour or two before you even start the bypass. Yeah. And it allows me to do that robotically yeah. uh, rather than opening or just aborting completely. So, yeah, that was me today. And I was like, oh my gosh, laparoscopically, <laughs> I would have, I, I was four hours, two hours of license of adhesions. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I brought up kind of hugging the pouch. And again, I don't use a bougie or a measuring device, but you definitely can. Um, but you know, it's always tempting to go lateral right there. That's where the splenic hilum is. And that where you, that's where you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, you really got to commit yourself to go more medial. It does help to have some sort of sizing device that gives you a better idea, but you don't have to, uh, but you, it's always more medial than you think. Uh, and so, and if you have a hiatal hernia, it's another way when you do the angle of his dissection, you can see whether there's a posterior hernia there as well. Mm -hmm. So. So Monique had mentioned um, when she does the PARS technique, she usually uses a vessel sealer to take the um, the vessel. And I do the same. But, you know, for you guys, what do you guys do? Are you stapling or are you using a vessel sealer to take it down or some other method? Well, I, I do the perigastric, so I don't typically don't take that vessel of the time? at all. What's that? 100% of the time? 100% of the time, yep. Okay. That's He's gotten so good at it. He never bleeds. Yeah. Well, so, so when there's a small, small amount of adiposity there, I can take one white load stapler, get across the, mm -hmm. the um, part of the vasculature, the descending uh, branch of the left gastric, and enough of a horizontal staple line that I'm not wasting an extra stapler. Sometimes mm -hmm. I just do an extra one with mm -hmm. a guard, especially if there's a lot of uh, a vascularity and adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, you know, I still kind of do this um, the way I was taught lap, which is um, for the descending branch, I burn above and below, and then I burn in the middle and transect in the middle. Um, so I, I always use a vessel sealer and sorry, Scott, I'm, I'm with Monique. It always bleeds for me when I try <laughs> very gastric technique. Um, so I haven't done that actually in a couple months. I haven't even tried in a couple months. So there are always uh, times where it looks tempting and it looks like it's going to be perfect and you just roll, roll, roll. And then it's like, you get into one bleeder and it's like, Oh God, why, why did I try this? So. Yeah, Scott, it's... you're not alone. I'm doing the same thing as you. <laughs> oh, there we Dimitri. go. Hey team, Demetrius, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I remember as a fellow training the, the paragastric technique and remember just hating it. And it's funny because that's what I do now, but uh, definitely more than one way to skin a cat here. And uh, hopefully yeah. All the fellows on the call can see that uh, there's clearly uh, some disagreement here, but that's okay. There's multiple ways to do it. And sometimes one way doesn't work and then you do it the other way. And that's, that's all good. Yeah. And then also, I think for the fellows that are on here, I think whatever you're learning in your fellowship program and whatever com technique you're comfortable with, I think you should, you know, when you get out of fellowship, you should continue to stick with that. And then you can branch out and see which one really is more comfortable for you um, after fellow post fellowship. One caveat, perhaps, if I may add, is that um, one other difference, clearly doing it the past plaster, the technique is easier. No question mm -hmm. about it. There's always, there's frequently bleeding, not always when you go for a gastric. But the one downside is you're taking the vagus nerve, which we try to preserve with the perigastric technique. And I don't know that we have good evidence to suggest whether taking it versus not taking it makes a big good or big difference. There was a study I saw a few years back as a poster at Sages suggesting that they have more nausea vomiting, it could be random. We don't have good studies. So, mm -hmm. but the point is you're taking something that probably shouldn't be taking necessarily to make it easier on you, or maybe, so it, it may not be ideal is, is the argument of those who go perigastric. I, I do want to bring that forward uh, for the group's consideration. 
Yeah. And also they say that if you were going to do a reversal, right. I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. A reversal on a gastric bypass that you may have some, you know, issues with pyloric emptying and things like that. But I have not seen that. Um, I even reversed one of my own and she did just fine. So, um, so yeah, so I don't know. It, it, you're right. We don't have enough studies or good information on that. All right. We could probably talk about this for the rest of the lecture, but oh, we'll try to, to move on just uh, in the sake of time here. Um, so moving on to the gastrojejunostomy, and let me actually play the video this time while I'm talking. Um, so I do, um, uh, on the posterior gastric wall, as you can see the gastrotomy there, uh, it typically is between uh, the second staple fire and the third. Uh, sometimes it works out, it's between the first and the second, kind of at the corner of that staple line on the posterior wall. And then you can see the bowel that we'd already marked out previously. Um, it's a linear staple anastomosis. It's a little bit older video where I was using more blue loads. Now I do this always with a white load. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a 60 millimeter stapler, but clearly we don't use all 60 millimeters. Uh, again, it's the same sure form. Uh, it tends to be around uh, two and a half uh, centimeters. And then when you close it with the suture, it tends to be around two centimeters or so um, once it's all said and done. Um, and then I close it with a single low, uh, excuse me, a single layer, uh, three O absorbable VLAC, you know, suturing is not hard with the robot. And that's one of the benefits of it. It, I don't use the VLAC cause I don't want to tie a knot, but I do like it cause it maintains tension. So as we're sewing and as the fellow sewing, uh, we can kind of snug it up and kind of see how things are lying uh, as we go. And I don't have to worry about going back and re cinching every loop uh, until we tie it at the end. So, um, and just do a single layer here. You know, if it ever doesn't look perfect, we can always put a second layer. I know some people kind of go there and back and kind of like a single layer, but twice kind of thing. Um, I would say the downside of this technique, the way I do it uh, is beware of the dog ears. So you're going to have potentially uh, dog ears on either side. And you can see right there, we're kind of imbricating that in. And there's another one on the other side. Um, but you just have to be careful when you're doing that. And again, if it doesn't look great, you can always over sew that and do two layers. Or I even seen surgeons try to do three layers. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to do uh, the GJ. I'm definitely a less is more type of surgeon in general. And so a lot of my partners do uh, two layers or you know, sew over it twice. I just do a single layer here. Um, I go below the staple line as far as it'll go. And then eventually once I kind of run out of healthy stomach, you'll see, I think in this next bite, uh, essentially, we take a, a bite and it goes uh, essentially behind the staple line above it. Um, uh, some surgeons use bougies or an endoscope or some sort of Ewald tube to stent open the anastomosis. And that's a perfectly uh, acceptable way, obviously, to make sure you minimize backwalling. Uh, I don't use anything, again, kind of going to that theme. Uh, and that's just my preference, but that's an option too. You can uh, stick a, you know, endoscope or whatever it is you want to use down there just to make sure. Uh, I used to use a, the scope or a bougie until yeah. a couple of fellows sold it in, and then I stopped using it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, what do the start, other faculty like, do with their GJ? I'm curious. I, I do that, and then exactly what you just did, and then I take one VLOC and go the other way. Um, just to, and, and I was going to ask you, I have found now that I, I've, you know, I feel like that corner that where you have your stitch at, that mm -hmm. tends to be my corner where it tends to leak. I find, um, so I go, so when I put my other stitch, um, I start beyond that and kind of run it back and kind of limber, um, that staple line of the pouch, um, down. Um, so I didn't know if you have, if you, I mean, obviously you've been doing single layer and so it's been working for you. Um, and I, so I do, I do take about three or four more stitches past, um, the anastomosis. So once it's closed, take a couple more to make myself feel better. And because it's not, you're not tying it. I want to make sure that if it were to come say unraveled like one loop or so that your anastomosis doesn't open up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, and again, if it, if it doesn't look great, I will absolutely won't hesitate to put another stitch in there, mm -hmm. but if it looks fine, no, I, I, that's, that's all I do. I do a single layer, but it's Cornell stitch and it, I hand saw the whole anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Adrian. He's taking a break. He's having a heart attack. No, I'm here. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> uh, I cannot. So I do. I do my gastrodigastomy hand sewn. I start with the posterior barb suture, 
in order to set the table, kind of get it lay nicely together. I make my entrotomies about at one and a half centimeters. And then what I do is I do a bi-directional Vicro that I tie myself on the back table. Uh, and I always insist on tying it myself to make sure that, you know, that knot stays. And I start with my posterior layer, bring it around, tie it anteriorly, and then finish up with bringing the, the barb suture for a second layer anteriorly. And I will warn you that those barbs do their job and they do their job well. And if you come too close to the anastomosis and pull too tight, you will per string your hand sewn anastomosis. So learn from, from my mistakes I've um, I've had that happen to me once and had to uh, to take the barb suture out because it was purse stringed. Um, thanks to one of my one of my junior partners was a little overzealous. I'll throw him <laughs> right on <under> the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually do a double layer. Um, and it's funny because as I was watching you, I was like, I was just about to ask you how long it takes you to do this anastomosis because it looks pretty quick. Um, I know it slows me down when I do the double layer, but I actually, I sleep a lot better at night. So I usually sew up um, with a barb suture, the back row, um, and then I use a hook. I notice you're using the scissors here, but I think the hook is a little cheaper. Um, so unless I'm doing like a revision, um, I'll use the hook. If it is a revision, then I'll, I'll open the scissors because that's a little bit better for the adhesiolysis. Um, and I always start in the corner that you mentioned, um, you know, going towards the liver, because I think that is where the patients tend to leak. Um, mm -hmm. I stented over the anastom, um, like I passed on the bougie to do the outer layer and I go past where the anastomosis ended. Um, so I usually suture up that back wall and run it all the way across and go past the anastomosis again. So, I mean, it takes me a little bit longer, but like I said, I, I definitely, I roll over multiple times and stay asleep just fine. So. Yeah, I think no, Demetrius needs to give us a rebuttal. Why, yeah, why, yeah. So I was, more. I was gonna, if I, if I'm allowed to, to, to joke a little about this. So I yeah. think my technique is the best, mainly <laughs> because, mainly because there's a reason. Let me explain. Mainly because I heard people saying it tends to leak there and there, and I've never had a leak, so I don't really know where it leaks. Oh, Mine doesn't oh, leak. Oh. You drink yourself. Now you drink anecdotal. No, he he only has stable line infections, no leaks. <laughs> stable line infections. But I really don't know where it leaks because I haven't seen it leak. So, <laughs> are you using barb suture also, or you use? Uh, so like I I do what you all of, most of you guys do. I attach the uh, the root to the inferior staple line hmm. of the pouch. Then I open the holes, and then I use uh, two tied together, similar to Adrian, but I don't use Vicryl. I use monocryl. Hmm. Um, so the, there's a reason for that. And I think that's an important message for the fellows. Monocryl is the ideal suture to use robotically. Why? Because it has this sensibility. None of the others has this sensibility, so it's a lot easier to break them. Monocryl is very hard to break because it will give in, mm -hmm. uh, unlike all the others. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. Two, I really don't like using Vicryl, uh, Adrian, because you cannot pull it through if you don't pull it through consistently along the way. And I, it's a mistake that I do make often. Whereas if you have a monocryl, in the end, I just pull once and it pulls throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an advantage, which is also the reason why I don't like using barb suture for this, because I want to go sometimes back and improve my closure if, I, if it doesn't look right. And if it's barbed, you can really do that. You're going to destroy the tissue taking it out of the tissue, right? So so that's why I use two that are tied together and I go around and tie them at the top, but it's a Cornell stitch. Mm -hmm. Once I reach the corners, mm -hmm. I convert to Cornell stitch. So you never see mucosa anywhere. It's mm -hmm. all serosa. If I see mucosa, I'll put additional sutures, but that's why I do only one. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I tend to use Stratifix for that reason. So I use V-Lock on the outside on the ladder on the last line. And then, so this stitch that you're doing right here, um, Scott, that's what I use the Stratifix for. And I find that the barbs are not as aggressive, but they still hold the tension and they still slip through the tissues really nicely. So. Yeah, we're, we're a Medtronic uh, hospital. So we do have some Stratifix, but it's obviously some hospitals carry certain products. So. Right. Yeah. 
So just to reiterate, um, you know, we have mentioned this before, but there are so many different ways to do mm -hmm. this and you really just want to find a way that works for you and is safest for the, for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, it seems like we are a very slow moving ship. Um, are we, are we doing okay? I don't know how many slides you have. Uh, no, I think, I think we're fine. Going. I think, uh, okay. th these are the more important ones, the mesenteric closure and everything else after that, I think is not as controversial and we can kind of speed through that. So I think we're doing fine. Okay. It was good discussion. Um, you know, one of the other advantages that I, Monique was talking about with the, you know, the, the Omega loop is you never have a long, you know, I, I don't know if anyone uh, is a believer in my, the blind lens syndrome. I mean, I know this is kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, diagnosis of exclusion, but you really never have a long blind lip here because once your anastomosis is done, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously know exactly where you need to transect. And so mm -hmm. uh, this is me transacting now uh, the omega loop to turn it into a Ru limb. And so mm -hmm. uh, one of the tricks I do here is once I transect, which you can see just making the mesenteric closure, mesenteric defect there, is I actually keep the stapler in after it's fired and I use that as a bowel clamp. And mm -hmm. I uh, we scope every single one of the GJ anastomosis at this point to do our leak test and whatnot. So you'll see the stapler, I just put right on the bowel, close it, you can't fire it, obviously it's already been fired, but it's basically a bowel clamp. And that, this is how we do our, our leak test. So uh, kind of a fun trick to use the stapler as a bowel clamp, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I does everyone the, else do a leak test of some kind? And obviously there's ICG yeah. and other ways to do it as well. Yeah, I use ICG, but I use the I use the stapler as the bowel clamp as well. So I'll just clamp it because I'm I'm coming from arm one. So I'll clamp it right at that corner there and then um, slip it right underneath. And then um, the other thing I do too, just for efficiency sake is before I even transect the Rue, I actually close Peterson. So then I don't have to come back. So I'll just, you know, test it there, close, close Peterson's, then I'll transect because I don't want to have another staple or another instrument exchange. Gotcha. Yeah, that is that is a good idea. I like that. Um, so we'll move on. So the JJ. So, you know, I think there's the two most common ways is uh, the bidirectional or triple staple technique, uh, or there's the uh, just a single fire 60, uh, and then you uh, over sew the common enterotomy. I have videos of both here. Uh, this is my utility stitch, right? You can see the GJ anastomosis in the background. The bowel's already been divided. Um, and we're using that utility stitch, was, which is already on the biliopancreatic limb. And basically here you can see arm four holding it up and basically it holds up uh, both the rule limb and the biliopancreatic limb so that we can do our first fire of the bi-directional fire. Uh, again, uh, Julianne talked about using a hook here. I use scissors uh, to do the two enterotomies. Uh, just a trick is make sure you dilate this hole up uh, nice and big. That stapler is bigger than you think, especially the big anvil. Uh, and to make it life easier, uh, make sure you uh, uh, dilate those up. And so this is the first fire. This is coming from arm three, your right hand. And then you come back with arm one in your left hand uh, to do the other direction. And so it's about 45 centimeters each. Again, with the 60 centimeter stapler, or six centimeter stapler, excuse me. Um, and uh, and uh, this is the second fire here, as you can see. And then the last fire, which is the common enterotomy. So three fires, all white loads. Um, I think, uh, not, I think, but the advantage of doing this technique, of course, is you don't have to sew, which if you don't like sewing, great. Um, but also it is a larger anastomosis. Uh, the good news is decreased risk of stenosis, of course. Uh, but the bad news is, is an increased risk of intussusception. And so, uh, there's pluses and minus to that version of the anastomosis. Um, and then I'll show you the video of, uh, is this the other one? Oh, I think this is the same video again. Yeah. Yeah. There's another video. Here we go. Uh, this is my partner who, uh, like I said, I do one way. He does the other way uh, doing the, the 60 millimeter uh, fire. This is a revision case. So you can see it kind of looks like a bomb went off in there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they're doing the JJ same exact stitch to, to tether the bowel uh, together. But in the end, he's just going to do a single fire with arm one uh, with your left hand firing it from screen. You'll see screen left to right there. So. Um, what does what does the faculty do uh, as far as JJ anastomosis? What does everyone else do? I do I do this, but I don't do the um, don't do the, the stay tether stitch. stitch. Yeah, yeah, um, the tether stitch. So I don't do that. Um, and so I 
you know, I do the one single fire. The other thing I thought, um, I just thought of, I, I learned this little trick from somebody in the robotic surgery collaborative, but I put my, um, my cut and coag on, um, um, four and six. And so I use cut to make my enterotomy and it never bleeds in it. There's no thermal spread. Um, so little interesting. Yeah. It's super awesome. I just like literally go down. There's like nothing like your cut burdens. is your cuts at six or your co which, which one's my, which? Cut, my cuts at six, my coax okay. at four. Got it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, and I use that for my enterotomies. Um, and so it, there's literally no thermal spread at all. So none of those burn marks that you see on the bell. Um, it's really nice, but, um, and then, yeah. And then I do a like a similar technique for closure of my common Yep, so this are one's you guys a, taking down the mesentery when you um, separate the rule limb? No. I don't know. We've had yeah, a hot debate here at our- You don't divide the omentum, Scott, right? I, I almost never do. Uh, if it's really thick and I just, I, I need it just to make sure I have adequate length or just it's getting in the way, I will. But uh, if, if it's not in the way, I don't mess with the momentum. Every time I look at the momentum the wrong way, it bleeds. So I just, <laughs> I just stay away from it if I can. How about you, Dimitri? Um, I've used the double stapling technique. I think if you're going to use three staplers, like, uh, Scott showed, it is important that you staple by directionally, otherwise you'll narrow that significantly. Um, so when I do it robotically, I don't often do bi-directional. I use it laparoscopically more frequently. Robotically, because I hand saw the, the enterotomies, uh, unless the bowel looks really small, then I, I'll use uh, bi-directional. I did have a patient where, you know, when you put the anvil in, uh, not the anvil, the uh, cartridge side in, that kind of was filling the whole bowel. It was so small caliber. I did bi-directional. The patient did still obstruct and come back later <laughs> because mm -hmm. I guess... Yeah, but uh, the point is, I think you could probably minimize some of the obstructions at the JJ if you do uh, bi-directional uh, firing. Uh, but it's also important how you close the interotomy. I, I feel like I'm probably going to get some heat for this, um, but I close my common interotomy. So I do my JJ very similar to what Monique was describing. Um, I don't use a stay stitch. I usually just make two enterotomies and I do a single firing of a 60 stapler with the white load. Um, and then I oversew my common enterotomy in two layers. So yeah. I usually... I, I don't think that's controversial. I've done that. Oh, I do that. okay. Because I feel yeah. like, well, maybe that's not as bad as using the seam guard on the white. <laughs> the white <laughs> <laughs> No, the video I just showed is actually, it's the same stitch, but you, you notice my partner did it in two layers. He does yeah. a single running and then a Lambert back. So, yeah, yeah, I do. I do it I to, again, because I like to be efficient, but yet do the same thing both times. So I do the same thing, one stitch, one way, one stitch, the other way uh, for the GJ. And then the same thing for the JJ. So fire the stapler, one stitch, one way, one stitch, the other way. So right um closure i'll just kind of graze over very relatively quickly i think the technique isn't as important more so, so actually, just close sorry, your Scott, defense I, I have to interrupt you again um yeah. do you guys have questions to ask oh yeah sorry. there's one in the chat um oh, yeah. do you have reverse trend ellenberg what was that how much reverse, how much how much reverse oh, um so we we do have the trump i already say that the pf bed or whatever <laughs> um and so you can yeah. see the degree uh, it's usually somewhere in like the seven, eight, nine degree range. So it is some reverse trend Ellenberg, but it's not a lot for me, at least personally. Yeah, I'm like 12 to 15. So I have I you guys. Use, I use 12. My, yeah, my patients are standing up. I have them at like 20. So yeah. Um, I'm more aggressive with the sleeve for sure, but the bypass, not, not yeah. as much. But. Actually, just so you guys are aware, I have actually read the manual for the robot and it says <laughs> for, for gut surgery, the amp, the, the maximum that they recommend. And again, we do a lot 15. of things robotically. Yeah. It's 15 degrees. I know. I know. I'm aware. <laughs> I'm aware. Um, what, what do you guys do? 
if you are in the case, you've done the bypass, you, I mean, you're doing the bypass, the pouch looks great. It's nice and small. And for some reason, you just don't have reach and you're on a robot, surprisingly. Yeah, I, I had a patient uh, recently and I got to, I was too busy teaching about small pouches and whatnot and wasn't paying attention. Um, retrocolic is definitely uh, an option. Uh, first one, uh, even in this, in this patient, it was a big male. I had to do, uh, I did like a hiatal dissection and I had to do retrocolic. And even then it was, oh, so close. And luckily he did well, but man, I did not sleep that well that night. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I also think too, just, just uh, you know, one, I think dividing the omentum really helps because then you can get a little bit of reach um, over. So I do this kind of lift up and over um, to try and get it to really kind of push the colon down to kind of reach over. Um, I also will, like Scott said, hiatal dissection, all that kind of stuff. I have not, knock on wood, I've not had any situations where it wouldn't reach. Um, I, it's been close, um, but I haven't had any situation. And then the other thing you could do too, is move, move where you thought you're going to make your GJ. So just rotate the bowel a little bit more, see if you can see if you can get it. That's a nice thing. I think about the Omega loop, you're not committed to where you're going to put the GJ. So kind of try and see if the bowel is a little bit more. That's free. a great point. Yeah, yeah. A little bit more distal. So. And you guys mentioned there's a certain direction to rotate the bowel. Can you go over like when you're doing a GJ versus a JJ? Because I think you only mentioned one of them before. Oh, um, I didn't have the video on here, but yeah, when I when I uh, run the once you have the GJ done, you run the bowel and essentially you're going in a counterclockwise fashion uh, to set up the JJ. I didn't put that video in there. My apologies, but yes, uh, really really important uh, to maintain your orientation. Make sure your mesentery is not twisted. Uh, don't want to be doing ruin O's or anything like that as well. Uh, so like Julianne said, that's the part of the operation where you do not want to be bothered. And mm -hmm. if you're running the bowel and someone interrupts you, or you lose track, you just start over. It's not mm -hmm. worth it. Yep. Uh, make sure that orientation is right. Yeah. The other thing too, um, I've had, um, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I found that sometimes when I'm closing the JJ defect, the rulem just wants to, you know, kind of flop over. So I have started putting my patient in uh, just a little bit of right sided down so that the, the roux will actually stay down. So I just do eight degrees to the right um, just so that it'll stay down. So I do that at the beginning. I don't mess with because I do. I, we have the trump table. And I, uh, although it sounds like it would be really awesome that you could move it at the same time as doing things, it's really kind of become a pain in the butt. It's very <laughs> slow. Um, so I don't like to move it again. So I do um, 15 degrees and then right side um, eight degrees and and the ruling will just stay flopped over. So when you're running for your JJ, it all flops over to the right. Um, so that, you know, it's not in your, all that bowel's not in your way. So I want to chime in real quick because, you know, as, as you, as you increase the number of cases you do and you, you do more cases, you continue to learn even at the attending level. So I used to put my patients essentially standing up at 20, 23 degrees. And then I heard Monique last year say, no, 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 no. You don't need more than 10 degrees or so. So I say, you know what, I'm going to try. And gosh, darn it, as usual, she was right. <laughs> I think the <laughs> you tell my husband that <laughs> she, she ought to know, but if, but but the teaching point there is that all too often as we start a different platform, we try to replicate laparoscopic surgery robotically, and that's a mistake that we make in many aspects of the case. Mm -hmm. You have to treat the different the the operation differently, and utilize the you know the um, advantages that the robot gives you rather than try to do the exact same thing that you do robotically, uh, rapidoscopically, so to say. So <clears throat> the fact that we don't have standard patients up, you know, that may decrease the chance of, of, of blood pooling in the lower extremities, maybe lower rates of, of uh, the physiologic insult that we create with, with a severe reverse Trendelenburg. Mm -hmm. So something to keep in mind now today my fellow was trying to replicate a robotic operation laparoscopically. So we we tend we we're starting to do that now too, the other way. Mm. But just the something omega loop. Robotic use use the technology where it shines. So did any does anybody else think that, that we tend to do that? I yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. You know, Adrian, I was going to tell you that um 
I appreciate your comments, but I'm still planning on having my patient stand out. <laughs> <laughs> but then you were like so you're saying Monique is wrong oh, like, all these changes and yeah she hasn't tried it the other way she won't do it the other way um so there's a question about your sutra choice Scott for um yes. doing the pizzas and like closure so I usually use a non-absorbable uh v-lock um and I use it for both defects um but why do you end up using the silk so uh, it's so the way I trained actually I've always done the Petersons in a purse string, um, in not a running. And so if you use a purse string, you can't use a V lock because it wouldn't hold. Oh, but you um, can. You can. You yeah. Can. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, a, I do a purse string. Oh well, then that would be something I would learn. I mean, I just yeah, I just I use the silk laparoscopically. I just use the silk robotically, and that's kind of where I went. But. I would be interested to see the the technique of a purse string with the V lock. So, yeah, so and then there's true. also there's also been a lot of arguments about silk. You know, because we're always taught that silk is absorbable is non absorbable, and so there's so a bunch of studies that I don't know. It's anecdotal, so but very very slowly absorbable. Correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> so so it's possible. So so people have been if you're as a suture choice, if you're, you know, an option to silk would be eth like Ethabon, some sort of Ethabon suture um, is a little less, I guess, slowly absorbing. Um, and then, yeah, the non-absorbable VLOC. <clears throat> uh, Dimitri, how are you closing your defects? Uh, I can tell you one thing better than Scott showed in his video, but I don't know that. <laughs> So it's this, every the way, way he you close this perfect. defect, Scott would not have passed my my approval <laughs> if the fellow would close this. So I, I tried to visualize it, right? So the way the video you showed, you didn't really visualize the all the elements where it really turns around to the left. Um, so anyway, I, I do start with a purse string and then run it up. I don't finish the, ever with a purse string because a purse string yeah. won't close the whole defect. Right, mm -hmm. so you still have the upper part. Now sometimes it it has an L configuration, mm -hmm. at which point I'll start I run it like an L from left to right and then right top, if that makes sense. Uh, but those are the two ways, uh, the two ways to do it. And I just wanted to teach this card. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I can take it. I'll dish it out later. Don't worry for your presentation. <laughs> so interesting time question coming, here in the chat. Um, are there techniques that you use to prevent kinking of the JJ when you do the Omega loop? Yeah, so I, we had a long discussion uh, at our institution, you know, because when you do the Omega loop, we tend not to divide the mesentery. Um, and when you do the laparoscopic JJ technique first, a lot of people do tend to divide the mesentery. And so the question was, if you don't divide the mesentery, it does visually look like it kind of the ruling takes a sharper turn into the JJ and whether that's clinically significant or not. Um, you know, I personally I don't think it, I've never had a knock on wood an issue with that, uh, but I also do the bi-directional technique. So it is a bigger JJ anastomosis. And I think that also helps. Um, I know others uh, talk about instead of making your mesenteric uh, or excuse me, your enterotomies directly anti-mesenteric, you angle them a little bit inward, so to speak. And that helps with that uh, angle. Um, I, I'll be curious what other people think, but. Uh, that's the technique I use, and I, I've never had an issue knock on wood to this point. So yeah. I actually divide, um, I do divide the mesentery a little bit. I'm not super aggressive. I usually will do mm -hmm. like two at most three bites um, with the vessel seal coming down um, before I do my JJ. Um, and I also use an anti-torsion stitch. So after I do my stapling and I close everything, I do one stitch to kind of pull up the JJ towards um, the cut edge of the BP limb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. And I actually will take that cut edge. Um, so, you know, your, your little, your, um, on that end that you have at the end of the BP limb, it's pretty long. Yeah for where I would make my, um, and my enterotomy on that side. And then I actually roll, like I'll pull the rule limb up and roll it over, um, kind of like an, like a roll in stitch basically. Um, and then it actually ends up rolling in that staple line, um, a little bit. Um, I, I have found that I've had, I mean, in full disclosure, I find that when I was doing lap and maybe because I didn't do as many lap bypasses prior to, to switching to robotic, but I have found that I've had more patients come in 
with swelling at the JJ, um, you know, and we've had to watch them and whatever. And so I don't know, I do one single fire 60. Um, at, at first I was doing one single fire 60 and then stapling the anastomosis or the common. Um, and now I over sew it. Um, and so, you know, we haven't had to do anything or take anybody back, but it's super annoying to have somebody come in uh, with a little bit of swelling at the JJ and they have some, and you know, the, the ER scans them and then it says, oh, they possibly have a small bowel obstruction. Um, so um, we've just waited those patients out, but, um, but I don't know if it's just a run of those patients or what, I don't know. One, one trick that I do, at least with mine, and I just kind of pause it there, is the end of my mesenteric closure for the JJ, is you mm -hmm. notice I do bowel to bowel. And it basically mm -hmm. what I do is I kind of try to take that sharp corner out. And that's kind of yeah. like my anti-torsion crotch mm -hmm. stitch, whatever you want to call it. So it's a part of my JJ closure. Right. Uh, kind of going back to the efficiency. So that's another option. And again, it's voodoo. Nobody knows, right. but that's what right. I do. <clears throat> and I agree. And that's what I do too on my, on this closure. Uh, I'll try and roll bowel to bowel and just kind of get it up. And so that it's really kind of coming in as a general curve uh, rather than kind of flop down on itself. But I don't know. I don't, I have no idea. So yeah. uh, Scott, I, I would like to correct you because Dimitri knows. Dimitri knows. <laughs> I know what. I have no issues here. None whatsoever. No, no, no. You know so how to I do actually... the perfect bypass. Yeah. So, um, um, I actually don't use an Omega loop because I'm an old dog. Uh, so I kind of got learned it to do it uh, first JJ and then the JJ and I haven't really changed it. I'm sure there's some benefits, but I really worry about missing the orientation when you lift it up. I do lift it up to make sure it reaches. If it doesn't reach, I do go retrocolically. I do this maybe one every 15 bypasses. It's not about the reach. It will always reach. The question is how much tension you put mm -hmm. down. Sure, okay, yeah. so I when I see too much tension, I will go retrocolic. I don't like mm -hmm. the tension, and I'm always surprised how close it always seems when you go retrocolically, and how far it always seems when you go mm -hmm. anticolic. Mm -hmm. it, every single time I do it, I'm like, really? It's right there. It's right next to it. If you go <laughs> retrocolic, okay. But, but Demetrius, as your friends, friends don't let friends do retrocolic gastric bypass. <laughs> So again, <laughs> I said friends don't let friends do retrocolic gastric bypass. <laughs> Why? Because it's crazy. Anyway, so, so, so again, if it is, it's all about tension, right? So I, right. I don't like to see tension at the anastomosis. That's when I do it. I don't do it often, but there are definitely cases I will do it sometimes. Um, right. Now the JJ, I think the best way to prevent it from kinking, from obstructing, is the bidirectional. Uh, anastomosis we discussed because that also tends to to serve the purpose of the anti kick uh, anti obstruction stitch you're putting, which I also put if I'm doing it just one firing, because essentially what it does, right, we, when you go a little more proximal to the anastomosis, if the bowel kinks, it doesn't allow it to kink right where you close the enterotomy. That's how it's more likely to get obstructed. When it does it straightens that segment when you put the anti obstruction stitch. And I, and I do that. And I think that minimizes that risk. Can we I've get seen obstructions in the JJ, JJ, though. I have seen obstructions in the JJ. Sorry, Dimitri. Um, I wanted to get to this last question, even though we're already over time. Um, Scott had mentioned, you know, the location of the enterotomies when creating the JJ. Is it better to be on the mesenteric side or the anti-mesenteric side? What do you guys think? It's, okay. You don't ever want to be on the mesenteric side, but it's more instead of if you imagine the mesentery at six o'clock and you make your anti-mesenteric enterotomy at 12 o'clock, uh, people and I, I've tried it. I don't know if I noticed as much of a difference, but people say if you go more in the like three o'clock position, uh, kind of halfway between anti-mesenteric and mesenteric, it can help with that orientation. Uh, so you're never on the mesentery side of the bell. Right. Okay. I have to say, I actually heard somebody giving a talk proposing that you do it on the mesenteric side. So there are people out there who are- Yeah, doing... who, who go close to the mesenteric. Yeah, close close to the mesenteric. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Too. You can go ultra close and take also the blood supply. In the... <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, well, I, that, that's it for the technique. I mean, I had stuff about our post-operative regimen and kind of numbers and things, but I figure I'd just open up for questions and anything else before- uh, we close wrap up. I know we're already over time. I, I can't see the chat. Is there anything else, Julianne, or anything else you want to discuss? That was, um, that was the last question. Um, do you guys have anything else you guys wanted to talk about really quickly? 
Yeah, you can unmute yourselves and just chime in here. Always fun to talk with you guys about technique. It's, you know, the fellows always talk about how the best part of it is when we start bickering with each other. So I guess we got to keep doing that or else <laughs> they're not going to come back. So will, will the fellows have access to your presentation, Scott? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, Morgan's I mean, putting I just, it up on the YouTube, I think. Yep. This whole the whole presentation and discussion should be available to them, yes. Yeah, actually her um chat GPT person already started posting our comments. Yeah. Okay. So, I can yeah. share my PowerPoint too if that's helpful, but yeah, this whole thing should be available. Yeah, she said it's gonna be available on the you on the on the YouTube. <laughs> One million viewers by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I gotta run. I gotta go to an easy meeting. Yeah, but, um, I was but, gonna say. Let's bye, wrap up. bye, guys. Thank you. I had, Someone I had, a, had question. a question, though. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I had a question. Um, so we do our uh, lap JJs with a single fire sixty um, load, and then we do a closure with the common enderotomy with a sixty load as well. Um, so no, no one really does that with a robotic JJ, huh? They don't do a single fire and of a and then with a 60 and then close the common enterotomy with a 60. You can do this. If I may start the, discu the discussion, I used to do it. That's how I was trained to do this. You will see ball obstructions in the JJ with this technique. Not often, right? It's not like every other one. You'll see one every 50 perhaps, but you'll see more ball obstructions that way the JJ if you, if you use that technique. And that's why I, I switched, actually. That's how I trained. And then we, I, I saw a couple of ball structures, and then I started doing the bi-directional technique because I realized that that was the issue. Same. I, laparoscopically, I was trained that way, uh, same way, but robotically, I do the bi-direction. And I think one of the benefits of just being on a robot is that you it's easier for you to suture. You know? So I think a lot of times people don't close that common enterotomy laparoscopically because it, it takes extra time. It's not as you know easy for you to do it, but on a robot, you're super facile and it can happen very quickly. Yeah. So one of the ways that I saw in training was that we would use the robotic stapler to close the common channel of the JJ, but only use the lower portion of the stapler. So you would only get three... Uh, Finds a staple instead of the entire load across. Yeah, there's all different tricks. Some people do like puppets and kind of put a couple stage stitches and pull it up and then only partially put the stapler. There's there's ways to minimize it, but uh, Dr. Stephanides is correct in that you're you're increasing the risk of obstructions. But I mean, it clearly it works. There's surgeons out there that do it. It's that's the risk you're running though. Yeah. So again, just, you know, I would um, agree with what Monique had said earlier, which is, you know, in the beginning, when you guys are starting out, just do the method that you find you're most comfortable with, um, just so you can ensure you have good outcomes with the patients. And then once you get to the point where you've had a couple cases on the U belt, then you can start um, some other techniques. Yeah. So first you want to get good and then you want to get cheap and fast, right? But certainly first you want to get good, but eventually with any, t and this is something we need to bring up at some point, uh, when we talk about efficiency and cost, your institution is going to want to know why you're doing a case robotically. And you have to show some kind of benefit, whether it's a cost benefit, whether it's outcomes, whether it's decreased length of stay, fewer complications, it has to be something that to them is worth the utilization of the robotic platform. And if you're going to use three staplers, it's going to be a bit more expensive than using one stapler and a suture. Uh, when you guys are stapling the JJ, are you coming in through arm one? And if so, how do you move things around to ensure that you don't have any um, difficulty and can find the optimal angle for the stapling? I can say, I mean, with the technique that I showed and what I do is I still use that stay suture and that's kind of what I use to kind of manipulate the bowel. And I can also use arm four um, or arm three to to make sure that the, you know, sometimes the bowel is kind of kinked or whatever. You want to make sure that it's nice and straight so that when you insert the stapler, obviously you're not shish kebabbing the bowel on the, on the back end. So, Julia, I only use 112, so I don't have a choice. I use it always from the same oh, side. okay. 
So I, I, um, usually what I'll do to help prevent kinking is that I tend to move everything down a little bit into the abdomen. So again, my patients are standing up, um, you know, so there was a little effect of gravity and I think that moving things down helps to move the bowel onto the stapler a lot easier and you end up not having as many issues with the angulation. All right. We are super over time. Um, Dr. Shimke, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, I'm glad you guys were more vocal towards the end. I'm super excited for you guys to embark on this um, experience this year and for us to see you guys when you actually come for the hands-on course. Um, our next session is going to be, I don't remember when, sorry about that. Do you guys know when the next one is? It's in Jan. It's after the holidays. I know that, but I can't remember the okay. exact date. So Wow, we are not knocking it out. <laughs> <laughs> But um, thank you so much to the faculty. January 23rd. Thank you. Who's that? You're on top of everything, Juan. Thank you so much. You, you get a gold star. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Um, Happy we'll holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night.